Alpha. Hi guys, I'm Will Bard Lucas. I'm a wildlife photographer and also a Sony Europe Imaging Ambassador. And I'm Margot Raggett um, and I'm the founder of the Remembering Wildlife uh, charity book series um, and we're here today to talk about how photography can save a species. So the natural world is under serious pressure and the threats it faces are varied and numerous. Some of the challenges are daunting in scale such as those presented by an ever-increasing human population or climate change. As wildlife photographers, we rely on the natural world for our livelihoods. And I'm also very aware that the very act of taking photographs in an animal's natural environment involves intruding on their lives and having an unavoidable impact. And so for these two reasons, I feel it's my moral obligation to use my images to aid conservation whenever possible. But how, as wildlife photographers, can we have an impact and make a difference to conservation efforts? In this talk, Margot and I will share some examples of how we've attempted to use the power of photography to make a difference. So I see there being two main ways that pictures can help. The first is to directly raise funds for conservation efforts through selling products such as prints and books. And the second is in raising awareness, either on a local level or on a global scale, for example by highlighting issues that need addressing, encouraging people to be more considerate to wildlife, pressuring authorities to prioritise conservation and so on. Many of my projects feature a blend of these two aims, but in all cases I have a well-defined objective at the outset of the project because without clear direction, it's impossible really to have the focus required to be effective. So the first example I'm gonna share with you is my Ethiopian wolf project. So here's an Ethiopian wolf. And while they look like foxes, they're actually very close relatives of European gray wolves. And they're only found in a few high altitude Afro-Alpine habitats in Ethiopia. They're highly endangered, only around 400 exist, making them the rarest canine on earth, and also Africa's most endangered large carnivore. And human encroachment is a major threat to this species. Humans bring with them domestic dogs, and these dogs often have to fend for themselves. So they go out into the wolves habitat and they have to forage for themselves and often they interact with the wolves and this provides an opportunity for them to pass on diseases to the wolves. Diseases such as rabies and canine distemper. And every few years, an outbreak of one of these diseases decimates the wolf populations, leading to an incredibly precarious existence for the entire species. So in 2011, I teamed up with an American photographer, Rebecca Jackrell, and we decided to undertake an expedition to Ethiopia to document the wolves in partnership with the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program. To fund the expedition, we turned to Kickstarter to raise over $10,000 that we needed. Now, as you'll hear later from Margot, Kickstarter is an incredibly powerful tool for getting projects off the ground. But when it comes to running a successful Kickstarter campaign, it's really the marketing that is crucial. You need to have a well-developed plan to generate interest in the campaign. So firstly, this will involve leveraging your own audience and press contacts. But if you don't already have a large audience, then you may need to partner with others who can help you reach a wider audience. For example, another photographer or a writer or even the conservation organization that you're planning to support. So after we ran the campaign, we were able to donate a large portion of the proceeds directly to the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program. And they were then able to sort out the logistics for us and supply us with a vehicle and a guide. And so our trip to Ethiopia took place over about six weeks and coincided with the time of year when the wolves were denning. And our Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program guide was able to take us to the den sites and help us capture photographs of the wolf pups as they first emerged out of the den. And then we were able to photograph them as they grew up. And so it was a wonderful time and incredible to have this intimate experience with the wolves and this incredible access to the wolves as they are raising their litter. While we're out in Ethiopia, we also documented the conservation work of the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Programme. And our trip actually coincided with a very exciting period of their work. 
a few weeks before we'd got to Ethiopia, the conservation program had started this new initiative to try and vaccinate the wolves against uh, rabies. And so what they'd done is they'd got this new oral vaccine, which they'd put in meat and fed to the wolves, um, hoping that the wolves would eat enough of the vaccine to then get some antibodies. And then while we were out there, they were trapping the wolves, taking blood samples from them to test if there were antibodies and if they did have some sort of immunity now to rabies. And if this trial was successful, it was greatly going to improve the, the prospects for the entire species. On getting back, we got the good news that the trial had been successful. And so the whole outlook for the Ethiopian wolf looked a bit better. Now, after going out into the field and doing the exciting bit, getting the photos, it would be easy to lose interest and start thinking about the next photography project that I might get involved with. But really, it's after getting the photos where the good is done, where you can have the most impact. It's that hustle afterwards that really multiplies the impact of the photos you manage to capture. So to generate awareness and to achieve the conservation goals that we had in mind, it was necessary to generate some media interest. And to get this uh, to happen, really, it really comes down again to marketing and also storytelling. Whatever the project is, it's important to find a story that can really act as a hook to get the media interested in the project that you're working on. And in this case, the story was clearly around these conservation efforts and the fact that this vaccine uh, technique had now been established that was going to help the entire species. So we really packaged up the photos alongside this, this sort of story of hope and of good news. And this translated directly into a lot of exposure, really, uh, and publicity for the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program through things like magazine articles. Uh, we gave talks and lectures and also had a gallery exhibition out in America. And we also were able to team up with a writer, Jamie, to produce a book and donate a significant proportion of the proceeds from sales of that book to the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program. So as well as generating this awareness, we were able to donate um, funds as well. And in the end, it turned out that we were able to donate approximately three times the amount that we had uh, received through that initial Kickstarter campaign. So for every one pound that somebody donated to the campaign, that translated into a three pound donation to the Ethiopian Wolf Conservation Program at the end of the project. So what you can see from this project is really that the success isn't just about capturing nice photos. Storytelling, marketing and being entrepreneurial all feed into the success of a conservation photography project and are really the things that elevate the project and uh, make the most difference to when you're trying to you know, do something positive with your photographs. Thanks, Will. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this series of books, the Remembering Wildlife series. Um, we've actually been working on this for the last five years um, and Will was one of our very first supporters and, and backers in the campaign, so it's great to be giving this talk with him today. And I should say it's been very much inspired by the kind of work that he's been doing and he's been talking about already. Um, briefly, just to introduce myself, um, so I'm Margot Raggett. Um, I actually worked in public relations for 20 years in, in London uh, before I moved into wildlife photography and everything Will was saying about um, having marketing skills and PR skills very much has come to the fore in what I'm doing now. I don't think I'd be able to achieve what I have if I hadn't had that background. But I left that in 2010, very disillusioned with that world and, um, and set out to be a, a wildlife photographer and, and was working out in the Maasai Mara for a few months a year as a photographer in residence um, and that was all going very well. Um, now with Remembering Wildlife, my job description is pretty much everything. So uh, when I worked in the PR agency, I had people doing all the jobs and now I'm doing everything from sales to marketing to finance to distribution um, and I like to say head of blagging is my main role in terms of what I actually do. Um, just briefly to take you through a few of my images before I get on to the book series and the type of pictures that I was taking when I was out in Africa. Um, uh, this picture is actually my image from Remembering Lions and I think it's kind of a very good example of the type of pictures I like to take which is really trying to look in for a story within a, a scene or an image. Um, so these particular lions, this was the Rakero pride um, out in the Mara. Um, the males, Lipstick and Blackie, some of you will know, had actually abandoned them at this point and gone off and, and teamed up with another pride. And, and actually they were pretty hungry and they were watching 
um, four other big male lions who are um, on, on a kill and not able to go in and eat. So I think you can kind of see the, the hunger and desperation in their faces. And, and this kind of image is, is the kind of thing I like to try and capture. And I think maybe my thinking in the pictures I take has influenced the images I select for the, the Remembering series too. Uh, this guy um, sadly passed away at the start of this year, but very famous, um, the, one of the biggest tuskers left in Africa, Tim, out in Amboseli. Um, and again, he was a real showcase for, for Amboseli. I don't know if in your talk, if you've got any pictures of Tim. No, but, I never photographed him. Right, but you've certainly got some of his yeah. compatriots yes. who are yes. very yes. large tuskers. Um, and again, it, what's amazing, he, he was such a gentle giant, you could get relatively close and he was not threatening at all and, and get shots like this so I think the fact that he's one of the very last of those big tuskers because they've largely been bred out through uh, poaching because the bigger the tusks the more of a target they are for poachers um, is is very poignant and one of the things that we want to address certainly through the Remembering Elephants book which we'll come on to. Okay, so I mentioned um, Blackie out in the Mara before. This is actually um, that lion um, with the new pride that he'd moved on to at that point up on um, the, the ridge. Um, this shot is actually quite a good way of talking about trying to anticipate images rather than just taking them. And this is something I often advise people on that um, you should be making an image rather than just taking it. So we, it was quite late morning, we'd come up, and we'd found the pride of lions, they'd finished a kill, they were all lying under a bush. Um, panting in the heat um, and there wasn't really an image there but lots of other photographic vehicles were around kind of trying to watch them so we look could see that there was a watering hole off at a distance um, lions will often go and drink after they've eaten because it's very thirsty work and um, drinking kind of salty blood um, so we actually went down to the watering hole and positioned right round the other side hoping that he would take the shortest route into the water um, and even better that some of the cubs might come with him and, and sure enough as if a script um, he came in so this cub was being a bit cheeky coming in and kind of annoying the, the male lion Blackie and um, it just got for a really nice interaction again so um, this was a, a fun warning when um, it all went to script. Uh, these cheetahs are actually, um, I think they were Malaika's um, cubs and they were sub-adults at this point. Um, so this again is my image from remembering cheetahs. Um, and what happens when cheetahs get older, to, I think these are sort of 18 months to two years old, and they're starting at that point to actually follow mum when she's hunting, if they actually get involved and they really disrupt the hunt and it can be very difficult. So they were being pretty well behaved at this particular moment, but mum was off hunting and, and they were kind of learning from her. Um, it's interesting, one of the facts I've learned about cheetahs from, from putting together the book this year is if cheetahs don't learn to hunt from their parents or their mother, rather, um, then they actually don't learn at all. So if you take a cub from the wild when it's young and then try and rehabituate it as an adult later on, if it hasn't learned hunting from its mother, it won't be able to do so. Um, another just moment in time, um, I call this picture Missile Lock, and this was actually a lioness in the Mara. She had just spotted um, something that she was potentially interested in, in killing. You can see here that suddenly she's completely focused and locked on to the kill that she wants to try. I think she did try and hunt on this day, but actually she didn't succeed. Um, but yeah, that particular emotion and expression of the face was what I was kind of interested in, in taking the picture. Um, and these are the rhinos that I had in Remembering Rhinos. Um, and again, this is a black rhino. Uh, there's only around 40 in the Maasai Mara. So to actually have her with her calf was um, a, a wonderful sighting. And normally they're very skittish out in the Mara and disappearing into bushes. So to actually get them out in the open that day was um, a real treat. Um, and then this little one, I call this picture resting place. Uh, so when uh, elephants are born, um, they pretty much have to get up on their feet and start walking with the herd immediately. Um, this one was very young and obviously very tired. The herd were moving a long distance throughout the day. Um, and I think this was at like seven o'clock in the evening and, and every time mum stopped, um, this little one would rest on the, the, the leg in front and try and get um, 40 winks. So it was a very sweet moment um, and yeah, a very memorable sighting. Um, and then another cheetah again. So on this particular day, we had actually um, gone out, couldn't find anything first thing and then saw hyenas going crazy looking up over past where we were and looking with binoculars down on the ridge. 
um, we looked behind us and realized that there was a cheetah there with these cubs um, and the hyenas started coming in. So the mum very quickly um, was trying to take the cheetahs away with her, um, sorry, the cubs away with her. Um, and we followed them all morning. They did about 10 kilometers before she managed to escape. Um, other predators are one of the biggest threats to cheetahs, um, and particularly in the Mara, it doesn't, it's a bit of anti-intuitive that you think a reserve is a safe place, but because other predators are doing so well there, um, cheetahs are very vulnerable. Um, the hyenas would kill those cubs if they could get hold of them. So this particular moment there, you can see the exhaustion on the mother, but she had actually steered those um, little cubs to safety. Um, and final picture from me just before I move on to the next phase of my life and doing this photographic series. This is actually up in Nakuru, um, a, a leopard. The, the yellow fever trees in Nakuru are absolutely stunning. Um, and when we got word on the radio that there was potentially a leopard in the forest, we, we raced up there to try and find it. Um, and this setting is just so particularly stunning. Um, and lots of photographers I know who go to Nakuru all the time never get to see leopards there. So. Um, they're quite jealous that we managed to see this particular sighting on the day. Um, and I just love the depth of this. Um, it was taken at a very long distance and actually the, the lens I had wasn't that sharp at the time, but I, I don't think it, it matters for the, the, the depth of the scene and um, very beautiful. At the end of that particular trip, just after I'd been in Nakuru, um, I went up to northern Kipi, uh, Kenya to Lakipia. I was in a place called Lakipia Wilderness Camp, which I know that actually Will knows very well as well. Um, and we were woken up at about four in the morning by the sound of hyenas going absolutely crazy. Um, so at first light, we went to try and explore. And in that particular area, because it's private land, you can get out on foot. So we actually had to track to try and work out what was happening. Um, and we turned around the corner and um, and forgive me, this is the image that we actually saw. Um, it was explained to me that this elephant was probably about 14 years old. Um, he had a poison arrow still in him. Um, I was just aghast at this scene. Obviously hyenas had started to, to attack the body. Um, the tusks were still there. So I was saying to the guys, what possibly happened here? Why would this, you know, what, why would this elephant be dead? And they said that probably the poachers had shot him with a poison arrow. He had bolted and escaped them, um, but it would take him three or four days for him to actually die. And it would have been a very slow and painful death. Um, and they didn't even know whether he would have been dead by the time the hyenas had got him or whether he'd just kind of collapsed at that point. And the, the sight and the smell was so overwhelming. Um, I was just filled with emotion I've never had before. And I was, impotent with rage. I was just like, no, this this can't be. You know, I've just spent the last month in Kenya photographing beautiful elephants and like that baby, you know, just a couple of weeks before. And suddenly I'm confronted with this. And I just thought I've got to find a way to channel all of this emotion that I'm feeling. I, I you know, it's easy to put a rant onto social media and say how angry you are, but I, I need to do more than that, actually. Um, and at that point, I realized that all of the skills and background and experience and everything I've been doing in my life all kind of came to one pivotal moment. So a bit like Will was explaining earlier, um, our purpose for our books is, is the same as well, it's twofold. So it's first of all to raise awareness of the threats facing a species, um, and secondly to raise funds to actually try and protect that species. So as part of any talks I give on the books, I always want to just very briefly explain what the threats are that are facing each of the animals. So. When it comes to elephants, there are roughly 400,000 left. Um, they are being poached at 30 to 40,000 a year. Obviously, new elephants are being born, but if you extrapolate that um, within 10 to 15 years, you could have very few left if the current rate of poaching continued. And when I learned that, I again, at the same time as having seen the poached elephant, I was so shocked at that. Um, that that really provoked in me the idea that actually what would happen in 10, 20 years if there were no elephants left? Um, if we were to do a book on them, would that actually be the only place you'd be able to see what elephants have been like in the world? And that's how I came up with the title Remembering Elephants, um, because it would be the, the tribute to what they had been like. And that was such a shocking and kind of horrible thought um, that I wanted to keep that thought in the title because I wanted to provoke people as to what we could actually lose if we didn't do something now. Um, they are mostly killed for their ivory for the Far East market. Um, there has been movement since we made Remembering Elephants in terms of the ivory trade, antique ivory trade in the UK has been shut down and China's also shut down a lot of the ivory markets out there. But there is still a time lag um, and there is still money to be made from poachers killing elephants. So the battle hasn't been won there. Um, but also other threats for elephants as human population grows, um, there are more and more conflicts with elephants. So you're seeing more and more 
people actually going out and trying to poison or shoot our, um, elephants because they're coming onto farmland, destroying crops. So some of the initiatives we've been sorting, something like the brilliant Save the Elephants um, initiative, which is called Bee Fences, where actually they put beehives around on a fence around crops. Um, elephants hate bees, so if an elephant knocks the fence, the bees swarm and the elephants run and scarper and the, the crops are protected. So. When I started this series, I thought that actually I was going to raise money to give guns to rangers to protect the animals, and that would be that. And, and I've now learned in all this time how terribly complex it is. And, and things like bee fences, I never imagined we'd be investing in those with money from these books, but, but we certainly do. Um, so as I said, the, the solution that we came up with this first book and, and has now been the series is a book that is a tribute to the species. Um, I wanted it to have mass appeal. I didn't want it to have images that were shocking like the one that I just showed you that, that set it all off. I wanted something that you'd want to buy your children or your grandmother for Christmas. I thought a, a Christmas present to try and get mass sales would be a great way of kind of raising awareness um, and also raising money. The way to do that, um, again, playing exactly to what Will said, is um, have famous names involved or have other people involved or organisations involved that are going to actually um, help you spread the word. I certainly wasn't in a position that anyone knew who I was, so I wasn't going to be able to, if it was just images from me. Um, but fortunately, I um, have become very good friends with Jonathan and Angela Scott, who are here on the right. Um, and they were very supportive and signed up pretty much immediately. Again, Will was one of the very first people. I remember we were at the Wetland Centre and I, I said, I'm doing this thing, would you consider it? And straight away he said yes, which was amazing. Um, and then here on the left, we've got Art Wolf, um, the loveliest man. Um, again, very famous photographer. And, and once you have those names on board, and I could say I've got Will Burrow, Lucas, the Scots, Art Wolf, everyone else started saying, well, yeah, they're doing it, I'll do it. So it became self-perpetuating. So um, we signed up 50 photographers. I just had in my head that that would be a, a good number to go for. Um, and we designed a cover very early on, um, which is using this beautiful image by Federico Veronese, who is a, a Italian based out in the Mara, who I'd spent a lot of time kind of seeing around the Mara at that point. Um, social media and spreading the word, as Will said, um, really got the news out there that we were doing it. But we set out to then do a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and I set out for £20,000 thinking that would print 1,000 books, but if we didn't succeed, then we just wouldn't go ahead. And I really had no idea whether we would actually raise that amount of money or not. Um, so we went live at 9am on, on a, I can't remember what day of the week it was, but we went live at 9 and um, we hit it within 12 hours. I was absolutely astounded. Um, and it was the, the Kickstarter, I'm sure Will's had the same, and you, you have an app that every time someone pledges, you get a notification. And it was going like a fruit machine at one point. And I was just drinking a glass of wine, watching it till we hit the 20, which was um, amazing. Um, and so that late, we actually raised enough to print uh, two and a half thousand books that first print run. We've done many more print runs of Elephant since. Um, and we turned that into 135,000 pounds worth of profit for elephant conservation um, which was beyond my wildest dreams. I, I kind of had in my head 100,000, um, but yeah, that 135 that first year uh, was just incredible. Um, and now we have a slideshow of um, images from that book so you can see them. Um, and another nice piece of this story is that um, I was driving one day in London where I live and I heard this particular track um, by Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel come on the radio and I just, oh my God, that's just perfect for what we're trying to say here. Managed to track down Peter Gabriel's agent and he actually gave us permission to use this track and then he also shared the book for us on his social media which made it go even further. So, enjoy it. I've changed 
So what Margot's example shows us is the power of partnerships and collaboration. And sticking with the theme of elephants, my next project really illustrates this point as well. I partner with conservation organisations whenever possible. And these can be very mutually beneficial partnerships. I can help them with fundraising or awareness. But what do I, the photographer, get out of it? It might be enough just to know that you're doing your bit for conservation, but if you invest a lot of time and money in a project, then should you also get paid? Well, I would argue that usually no, because by partnering with conservation organisations, you can get something much more valuable, and that is access. Don't worry about giving your work away for free in the name of conservation. See your time and skills as commodities that can be traded for access. And then you can use this access to capture something remarkable. So see your photography as a way to build your brand and raise your profile. And the payback will come in other ways through things like speaking engagements, sponsorship, uh, more workshop clients or print sales. So my Land of Giants project really illustrates this. Back in 2016, a friend introduced me to Richard Moller of the Savo Trust, and he was working in Savo to conserve elephants. And he set up the Savo Trust around 10 years ago in response to a terrible surge in poaching. Now, for any partnership like this to work, you really need to prioritise the needs of your partners. So that involves understanding their needs, asking them where they need help. And I did just this with Richard, and what I learned really got my pulse racing. He told me that amongst Savo's elephants are some true giants. Elephants like the one Margot showed earlier, Africa's last remaining big tuskers, with each tusk weighing more than 50 kilograms on both sides. And it's thought there's, that there's less than 25 of these big tuskers left on Earth, and around eight of them can be found in Savo. And here's a picture with one, and you can see just how big he is compared to regular elephants. Now these big tuskers are under serious threat from poachers. And one of Savo Trust's key goals is to keep the big tuskers safe, because in effect, by protecting those few big tuskers, you are actually protecting all of the elephants that live in that area. Now the big tuskers in Savo have only survived the years of hunting and poaching by being extremely shy and living in the remotest areas of the park. And because of that, very few photographs of them existed and actually few people even knew that they were there. And that is where I could really help Savo Trust by photographing some of these big tuskers and putting together a book that they could then use to show potential donors that these elephants are still out there and it's not too late to save them. So I made a plan with Richard uh, to put together this book, which I would title Land of Giants. And it would be a collection of my photographs taken in partnership with the Savo Trust, with their help. And then I would give over the text of the book really so that Savo Trust could communicate their message through the book as well. And Sonny actually kindly gave me a grant to fund the first part of the field work for this project. And then it was a, a question of tracking down those big tuskers. So Savo itself is vast at 40,000 square kilometres. It's roughly the size of Switzerland. And so looking for these few remaining big tuskers in an area that size was a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. But with the help of Savo Trust, I was able to find them. And to find them, we basically had to fly. And it would sometimes take three days of flying to eventually locate the tusker we were looking for. And when we did find one, they were usually unmistakable as their massive ivory sort of caught the sunlight and glinted. And then after we found them, they were usually somewhere like this. And it was then a case of landing and then trying to get close on ground so that I could get some closer up photographs. But as you can see, the bush was incredibly thick. And so often the only option was to get out of a vehicle and approach on foot, which meant we always had to stay downwind and be absolutely silent because these big tuskers were so skittish. After my first month in Savo, this was about the best shot I'd got of a Tusker because they were always in such inaccessible areas. But I went back again and persevered. And what I really dreamed of doing was capturing one of these uh, big Tuskers using my Beetlecam, this remote control camera buggy that I created to get these close up ground level, wide angle photographs. And after two months, I eventually managed to find the largest Tusker of all out in this open area. 
and I was able to deploy Beetle Cam in front of him. And this is a resulting photo that I got of him. And the perspective really highlights those incredible tusks stretching down to the camera and provides a bit of a different perspective. So Betacam allowed me to achieve a very intimate perspective in the um, photographs that I was taking for the book and allowed me to experiment with things like framing interesting shots like this. Sabo is also home to some remarkable female cow elephants, cow tuskers. And this one was known to the Sabo Trust as FMU1. And she's probably the most incredible elephant that I've ever seen, either in the flesh or even in photographs. Her tusks were so long that they scraped the ground in front of her as she walked. And until I saw her with my own eyes, I simply had no idea that elephants with tusks like this still existed in our world. To me, she resembled this prehistoric mammoth, like a relic from a bygone era. But sadly, these are amongst the last photographs captured of her. At the time I took these photographs, Savo was in the grips of a terrible drought. And while there was still water that the elephants could drink from a few waterfalls, Almost all the vegetation had been eaten. And sadly, a few weeks after I photographed her, she died of starvation. While her death was desperately sad, I believe it was in a way a victory for conservation because she lived a full and natural life that wasn't ended prematurely by a poacher's snare, poison arrow or bullet. So getting the photos for this project was, as I've said before, only the start. I then returned home and it was time for the real work to begin. So first of all, I had to finish off the book, which took a huge amount of time and effort, as Margot knows, just to get all the images prepared and sorted and then do the layout for the book. That was probably a couple of months of work. And then eventually the book was ready and it was time to start marketing it. And again, what I did was I looked for the story in the photograph so that I could find something to capture the media interest. And I decided to focus in on this uh, remarkable cow tusker who was in a way this queen of elephants and I explained you know, how rare she was and that these were amongst the last photos captured of her before she died of old age and this sort of hook got the media interest and got wider sort of coverage through places like BBC and CNN and I ensured in all the media stories that were put out there that you know Savo Trust's work was uh, sort of prominently uh, discussed and highlighted and the good work that's being done uh, to conserve elephants in Kenya. And so this led to obviously awareness for, for the Savo Trust and what they're doing and then also it resulted in you know, good book sales as well uh, to help us raise funds. And as a result I was then able to, to ship several hundred books out to Kenya that Savo Trust could then use to raise awareness for their work more locally by distributing them. Uh, to potential donors, to community stakeholders that live in and around these elephants, and also to uh, officials. And so ultimately the media and the book succeeded in leaving people with this inspiring message that while this particular elephant may be gone, the rest of Savo's magnificent tuskers are still out there and it's not too late to save them. Thanks Will, um, that's amazing. Um... Okay, so there are five books um, in the Remembering Wildlife series and we've only got up to elephants so far, so I'm going to race through the rest um, and try and bring you up to, to speed. Um, I thought I'd start actually, as, as people interested in photography, with um, showing you a bit about the process of choosing a cover star for our book each year, which I have to say is the most agonising and difficult part of the whole process. And I, I know Will's done many books, so it knows the, the, yeah. the, the agony you go through. Um, and these are just some that we were playing with in the early stages for Remembering Grey Tapes. Um, and we do have a formula for our books. We have an animal that's portrait straight on looking at the camera um, and also a certain expression I'm looking for for our particular books because we are remembering, which is slightly kind of imploring and, and you know, kind of, you know, asking you to, to, to help them. Um, so although we played with all of these images, none of these quite worked at all. And I thought the one on the right looked a bit Planet of the Apes. Um, and so the process of that can actually be quite infuriating. So um, this is actually how I was feeling. I think I was sending potential covers over to my editor that year, Ian Redmond OBE, who's a very famous uh, great ape conservationist. And every time he'd go, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. So I was getting quite frustrated. Um, but eventually this is the, the, the particular gorilla that we chose. Um, his name was Muninya. Um, again, sadly, we're talking about lots of animals that have left us, but Muninya died earlier this year. Um, he actually died of natural causes, thankfully, and he'd lived a, 
a good old life to his mid 40s. But the expression here by Nellis Walmeran, the photographer, um, you know, just really summed up what we wanted to do. And, and there's a lot of hype every year about who's going to make the cover and what image is going to be chosen. So um, I, I put a, a lot of thought into it and I, I'm always um, very anxious that people are going to like what we've chosen, but I think he was a popular choice. Um, so the issues facing great apes, uh, human population explosion, you're going to see there's a theme here, humans are largely the threat to most of the animals, um, results in less land um, for the great apes, so bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans. Um, you have snares left out for the bushmeat trade that are indiscriminate um, and any animal will get caught up, so I've certainly seen gorillas as I'm sure that you have with uh, locked hands or legs from, um, from snares. Um, mining for minerals from mobile phones. If you want to do something practical, um, don't just keep changing your phone every year, um, or at least if you do, recycle the phone that you had before. Deforestation for palm oil, um, human diseases, um, and actually with the time of corona, it's been very interesting, and they've actually banned a lot of kind of human interaction at all with the gorillas to, because it would be so easy for them to catch. They can catch colds from us and flus um, very easily, so corona would just be deadly. Um, and then there's still trophies in the pet trade that are threatening them. Um, I was lucky enough with apes to actually be able to work with um, Jane Goodall or Dr. Jane Goodall, who um, is uh, a renowned uh, chimpanzee researcher originally, but who now spent her life traveling the world um, trying to raise awareness of conservation issues. And again, was very inspirational in this journey. Um, and one of the things I find interesting about her is that she um, it has on record said she would prefer to actually just be in the forest watching the chimpanzees but she realized that actually she could achieve more by traveling the world and raising awareness than for their future than she could just by sitting in the forest with them um, so she's I think she hasn't slept in the same bed for more than three nights in the last 20 years or that's until corona um, got her locked down in the UK but a remarkable dedication and a real inspiration for everyone who wants to to work in conservation um, so it was a delight to show her the books um, and also she signed the certificates for our limited edition books that we do every year um, that year um, so the process we print out in Italy I've just been out printing remembering cheetahs just now um, we have the uh, copy straight off the press uh, with me that will be out in October um, and so actually the, the process again we're on press for sort of four days or so signing off every image and, and you print on big sheets so um, you can have images from lots of different photographers all in one row and actually if one's looking a bit too blue it affects everything else so it's quite complicated the process but I think it does make a difference to the quality of what we're able to achieve um, I wouldn't print without being on press myself anymore. Um, and then spreading the word and social media, um, as, as well as said, and we've said before, is very important. So I took it one step further after the first couple of years when um, we were relying on the reach of our photographers and, and thought, actually, can't I reach into the celebrity world? I think Peter Gabriel kind of inspired me having um, shared it for us. So um, every year we try and do a bit of a campaign getting celebrities copies of the book and see if they'll do pictures for us. So. Um, Ellen DeGeneres here I think is the seventh most followed person on Twitter in the world and has 75 million followers so the day that she shared it um, uh, everything went crazy in terms of the alerts on the phone coming through and it certainly helps to, to spread awareness. Um, and then traditional PR again so obviously we've got a set of beautiful images that we can work with um, so lots of picture stories um, that we can go for and then um, usually we have an annual exhibition in London so again getting media down to that as well and that allows us to talk about the issues facing the animals which is a big part of our mission to actually try and explain those to people. Okay so moving on to Lions uh, which was a book that came out last year um, there are roughly 20,000 lions left which um, surprised people a lot there are around 30,000 rhinos left so the fact that there are less lions than rhinos um, really shocks people um, and the threats to them, once again, mainly human-led. Um, so loss of habitat because of population expansion, um, and that results in a lot of conflict. Um, there's a lot of retaliation that goes on. So if um, farmers are having their herds attacked by lions, they will try and retaliate. Um, but once again, bushmeat snares is a, a huge issue that um, lions, are, that lots of species get caught in, but very indiscriminate. Um, hunting is also a factor in, in some areas um, as well. It's obviously a very controversial um, subject because 
people on the side of hunting say it protects habitat, but anyway, the numbers are being reduced because of lions most certainly, sorry, because of hunting of lions most certainly. Um, then there is also a, an illegal trade in their body parts. Um, and actually, traditional Chinese tiger bone wine has been replaced by lion bones uh, because you can't tell the difference apparently when you have the skeleton and there's not enough tigers left. So they're moving on to lions for those. Um, and then also in some traditional societies and Maasai societies, warriors are marking their um, move to adulthood by proving that they can kill a lion as well. So just so many threats coming from different angles at the lions. Um, so one of the best bits for me about running this book series is actually getting to see the money spent and getting out into the field and understanding how we're making a difference um, because that really then motivates me to keep going. So this was a particular trip out to Meru in northern Kenya just after we brought out the elephant book and what we were doing here is actually looking at some vehicles. We paid for tyres for 12 different vehicles um, that had been off the road. Um, so the rangers couldn't actually get to the far parts of the park at all. Um, the roads were so bad, the tyres were so bad, and so poachers were able to come in and indiscriminately kill. Um, and while we were there, we actually, um, one morning there was a lot of fuss and there'd been apparently gunshots the night before in the park, um, but the rangers, because the tyres that we had bought were on there, were out in the vicinity. They fired warning shots into the air um, and the poachers obviously heard them and left. So in the morning they found empty cartridges, but no carcasses of any animals so we had saved some animal that night through us buying tires um, and again you know I, I thought when starting this we're just going to buy guns and and now I realize we're buying tires we're buying fuel we're buying walking boots for rangers there's, there's all sorts of things and different approaches to, to conservation um, after the rhino book, we went out to South Africa to learn about some of the techniques there. Um, I'm here with a, a cold scent dog who is adorable, um, that she can actually track poachers up to 24 hours after they walk through an area. Um, so her, the scent of the poachers has gone cold, as they call it. So um, incredibly useful for trying to track down poachers. Um, you have anti-poaching patrols and the planes on the right. And then at the bottom here, we've actually got a rhino orphan that was being cared for in a secret facility because her mother had been um, poached. Um, and that particular facility um, in the back there, there's a rhino called Seya. I'm actually with a, a friend of mine, um, Dan Richardson, who's a kind of actor and um, ambassador for us. Um, Saya there, as you can see, was quite badly injured through poaching and was also being cared for at this, at this secret facility by saving the survivors. Um, and about nine months later, we heard that he'd actually um, covered, which is the phrase for, for mating rhinos, um, a female, and he's subsequently gone on to be a daddy. So the fact that actually um, this conservation in action is bringing new, new uh, rhinos into the world is, is a wonderful feeling for us. Um, and then I think this is one of my favourite pictures I ever took, and it's ironic that it's not of an animal, but um, but out there somewhere it probably is. So this is down in uh, in uh, private land on the border with Tanzania, um, visiting a project called Seralo in the South Rift Valley. Um, and they basically, all the lions there, all the animals there, are not in a reserve that's protected. Um, they are actually living among the people. Um, and so what Seralo does is actually go out and try and facilitate um, the ability of people to live alongside them and not retaliate. So they will go out and they'll warn locals, don't go take your cattle down to that area today because there are lions in the area. Um, they'll keep an eye on where they are. Um, they will help, um, as they described to me, if someone leaves a cow out at night, which surprisingly happens more than you think um, because it can be kind of escape the herd when they're bringing them home at night. If you leave it out, it's going to likely get attacked by lions and then there's likely going to be retaliation. So they will drive and, and collect the, um, the cow that's been left out. So they needed a vehicle that could um, perform many functions, including cow collection. Um, and we were able to donate them $30,000 to buy this one last year. So I got to drive down and kind of hand over the keys with it last year. And then as you do, there was a lovely helicopter, the pilot Andrew Belcher in camp and, and he offered to take me up in a helicopter so I could take this picture. And it just shows the kind of last remaining wildernesses and landscapes that um, need protecting if wildlife is going to survive. Um, we do normally every year do a, a launch at the Royal Geographical Society um, this year we're actually going to be going online. Our event is Thursday the 16th of October and we're going to be recreating as much of that um, feeling that we get um, every year but online for people so I hope you'll follow the link at the end of this to, to buy tickets and support us there. Um, 
And one of the things that's um, amazing is the international support we've had from the photographers here. So everyone who's standing in this picture is a contributing photographer and people um, generally come from all over the world to support us, which is amazing. And that's Greg the Toy at the, the front there, former Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Um, and we also normally do a, a big book signing every year, uh, which you can see which has become more and more popular and busy and crazy um, and people love it. And so what we've actually done this year is I've had photographers all over the world, thank you for sending yours, yeah. signing stickers, which they're all posting back to me in London. Um, and we're going to do 100 books, which are part of the VIP tickets that go on sale for the launch this year, which have all those stickers stuck in. So we can't do this for social distancing, sadly, but I can do the next best thing with, with our stickers. Um, and here, here are some of the photographers um, signing for us as well, uh, just to prove that they've been working hard for us. So finally, just to make sure we've talked about the threats facing rhinos, um, as I said earlier, there are roughly 30,000 left. And as most people know, they are largely killed for their horns for the Far East market. Um, their horns are made of keratin, the same as our hair and fingernails. And yet it's seen for as many things like an aphrodisiac or medicinal benefit in the Far East, which is complete nonsense. Um, they're also seen as a status symbol out there and for carvings. Um, and as I showed you earlier, they're often removed from the animal when it's still alive, so very traumatic indeed. Um, and South Africa has actually even legalised the domestic trade in rhinos recently. So um, it, international sales of any animal, any species part, whether it's ivory or horn or whatever, is a complete no-no because if you make anything legal, it's acceptable for people to trade in and, and we don't think that that's the right way to go. When you try your best but you don't succeed When you get what you want but not what you need When you feel so tired but you can't sleep Stuck in rivers And the tears come straight down your face when you lose something you can't replace when you love someone but it goes to waste could it be worse lights will To let it go But if you never try You'll never know Just what you
Okay, so remembering wildlife in numbers, um, we've sold 18,000 books so far with the series. Um, remembering Elephants is about to go for its third reprint, which is amazing, um, considering we did two and a half thousand that first year. Someone's paid six and a half thousand for one book with lots of signatures in. Um, more than 150 photographers have worked with us. Um, we, as of yesterday, have spent 634,000 pounds on conservation projects. We've supported 45 different projects across 23 countries. Um, and Remembering Cheetahs will be out on the 12th of October, but available for pre-order now. Um, and we have our online launch, which I mentioned on October the 15th. So I very much hope some of you will buy some tickets to attend that. We've got Franz Lanting and Chris Ekstrom, uh, Jonathan Angela Scott, and also Laurie Marker, who's the founder of the Cheetah Conservation Fund, um, talking about all the contents of the book. So go to our website, rememberingwildlife.com, um, to find out all about that and ways to buy our books. Um, and thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Will. No, thank you. That was uh, very inspiring. Well, thank you very much for listening to us today. Um, if you want to find out more about me, my website's willbl.com and I'm willbl on social media. And if you'd like to find out more about the kit I'm using, then check out my video about what's in my kit bag on the Sony virtual stand.